For this thermodynamics video, I'm joined by my TA Serenity, who you see right up here, because this video is all about her favorite law of thermodynamics, the second law. The first law of thermodynamics is very simple, conservation of energy. But Serenity is a complicated kitty. She likes the second law. And a quick glance at the Wikipedia page will help you understand exactly how complicated it is. There's 10 different versions that it lists, plus another seven corollaries. So it's very hard to explain briefly the second law of thermodynamics. Carnot's version of the second law states that if you have a hot source and a cold source and you operate a power cycle between them, the maximum efficiency of your cycle is gonna be dictated by the temperatures alone. So in this video, I'll show you a bunch of quick example problems in which you can calculate whether a given system is impossible, that is it violates the second law of thermodynamics, it is reversible, meaning that it is the maximum possible efficiency or that it is irreversible, meaning that it is below the maximum efficiency, which means that it is realistic in that there are some losses to friction and stray heat transfer. Serenity is looking the other direction, but she's listening very closely. So let's get into it. I'm Dr. Bernard, engineering professor. If you're wondering where Serenity went, she hopped up one level higher on the cat tree, so now you just get to see her tail wagging back and forth, but she is still up there. Looking at this first set of four problems, I see immediately a gift. The temperature is provided in Rankine, which is going to save a couple of steps. Whenever you're doing multiplication or division involving temperatures, you have to be in Rankine or Kelvin. If you're given Fahrenheit or Celsius, your answer will be wrong if you use those temperatures as is. A change in temperature, so subtraction, that can stay in Fahrenheit or Celsius, but multiplication and division always have to be in Rankine or Kelvin. So first step in evaluating whether or not each of these problems are gonna be irreversible, reversible, or impossible is gonna to be to calculate what is the maximum possible efficiency for this system if it were a perfect, no irreversibilities Carnot heat engine. And in this case, we get 66.7%. So now we just need to look at each of these four cases and determine if they are at this threshold, above, or below. In part A, we see 900 BTUs as heat into the system and 450 BTUs of that becomes work. So half of the heat in goes out as work. So that's an efficiency of 50%. 50% is below the maximum, 66.7%. So this is irreversible, meaning that there are some losses, some irreversibilities in the system, causing the system to perform a little bit less than perfect. For part B, we're given Q cold instead of work. So in this case, I've changed the numerator and replaced work of the cycle as Q in minus Q out. So if I draw a picture here of a system operating between a hot and a cold source, you can see just based on a conservation of energy that the heat in splits up into work and heat out. So therefore work must be heat in minus heat out. So plugging that into the efficiency equation, we get 66.7%, which shows that this is reversible, meaning that this system could only operate at this efficiency if there are no irreversibilities present in the system, which means that it's not practical in the real world, but it doesn't violate the second law of thermodynamics. For part C, when given work and Q out, we can replace the denominator, since Q in will equal work plus Q out. So this time we get an efficiency of 60%, which is below the maximum, 66.7, so this is irreversible. And this last problem gives us an efficiency of 70%, which is higher than the 66.7 maximum Carnot efficiency, so having this would be impossible. If these quick little examples have helped you understand the difference between a system that is impossible versus possible and reversible versus irreversible, please hit the thumbs up button below this video, which makes it easier for other engineering students like you to find this video so that they can get help also. So one quick note is I've been kind of switching back and forth my terminology between QH as Q in and QC and Q out. And I do this because it helps me keep straight which direction uh, the heat is flowing because a power cycle uses the same drawing as heat pump and refrigeration cycles. That is, it's, it's a black box cycle operating between a hot and a cold source. But refrigeration and heat pump cycles have the Q and work terms all pointing in a different direction. So QC for a power cycle is the heat out. But for a refrigeration or a heat pump, that would actually be Q in. So for a power cycle, I prefer to write these as Q in and Q out because it makes it easier for me to remember which one goes in the denominator. If this were a heat pump or a refrigeration cycle, I would keep them as QH and QC since it's easier for me to keep track than which one goes in the numerator because a heat pump is mainly concerned with QH and a refrigeration cycle mainly concerned with QC. 
But this is all personal preference. Use whatever subscripts you want. Okay, one more problem. This one a little bit longer. We'll get to an actual numerical answer instead of just evaluating numbers that are given and determine whether it's possible or not. So since we're trying to find the minimum possible heat rejected to the condenser, that means we'll have to assume that the work output is at the maximum possible efficiency. So this problem is gonna start off by using the hot and cold source temperatures to find what that maximum efficiency is. Then using that efficiency and the work output, we can find out how much heat must be being rejected to the cold source. And again, this problem is probably way too easy because the temperatures are already given in Kelvin, so no unit conversions were required and it ended up just being 50%, which I can just do in my head. You should probably expect your professor's not gonna be as nice as me and you're gonna have to use at least a calculator for this step. So next step is I write down my efficiency equation, that efficiency is work over Q in, and then note that I can replace the denominator, since I don't actually care about QH, I only care about QC, replace the denominator with work plus QC. And now since efficiency and work are known, QC is the only unknown left in this equation. So plugging numbers in, we find out that QC ends up equaling work also at 10 to the six kilowatts. And after writing down my answer, I see now that my terminology has actually been wrong. All of these Qs and Ws that I've written down should all have dots over them. So Q and W just by themselves stand for energy. And those would have units of kilojoules. But when using power, so a kilojoule per second or kilowatts, these should all be W dot and Q dot. Okay, I can't take all the credit. It was actually your TA Indy here who pointed out the dots to me. If you found this video helpful at understanding the second law of thermodynamics and the Carnot heat engine, and you wanna see more videos like it, consider subscribing to my channel so you can see each new video as they come out. If you wanna watch another video right now, you'll see a couple of links on your screen, so feel free to click on one of them. Thanks for watching and enjoy the rest of your day.